Service will begin in five minutes. Service will begin in four minutes. Service will begin in three minutes. Service will begin in two minutes. Service will begin in one minute. Service will begin in 30 seconds.
Thank you for worshiping with us here at Zion. Power for the journey. I think a lot of people, um, you know, say they're Christians and, you know, you're Christians on Sunday, but then come Monday, you know, your walk doesn't match that. And so, you know, I probably fell into that um, a little bit. And, um, you know, ever since then and over the last few years, I've really learned, I think, just what it means to like listen to God and than to obey. I mean, that's hard. <laughs> um, but man, if we just like obey, and a lot of times it is, it's out of my comfort zone. He asked me to, to do things like this or whatever. But, you know, if you do it, you just never know how God can use that. Uh, my name is Mary Graham, and I'm married to Matt. Uh, we've been married 22 years. Uh, we live in Garner and we have a daughter, Maddie, who's a senior in high school, and Mason's a freshman. Uh, and before we go much further, I want to share about my hair. <laughs> You're probably wondering, what in the world is that hairdo? Um, this is called chemo hair. Who knew that chemo could turn your hair white, or platinum, as I like to call it? Uh, I've been bald for several years over the last few years, so I'm just so thankful to have hair. So, uh, October of 2017, I was diagnosed with cancer, and that was never on my radar. It does not run in my family, you know, I just never thought I would get that. And um, I was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, and for me it's rare because it's normally found in teenagers. Um, I was 43 at the time, and it's found in the bones, and mine was in my chest cavity. And so the tumor wrapped around my arteries and it was around my heart and my lungs. So really a, an awful place for a tumor. Um, surgery was not an option. And so uh, at that time I began 10 months of pretty intense chemo. Um, I did, had five chemo drugs. Um, was in the hospital 47 nights during that time, mostly for the chemo. Um, I did six weeks of radiation and just had a lot of other issues going on that just were not fun. So after 10 months of going through chemo, they said I was cured and I was like, great, now I can get on with my life. You know, that was hard, but God was with me through it. Um, we had a big celebration and I'm, I'm like, okay, I can put that behind me. Um, but a mere eight months later, I had a PET scan and um, um, the doctor said it was back. Um, and it was back in the same spot, which was just not good news. It was very devastating. Um, you know, especially since I'd done all that chemo, you know, for 10 months and to have it return so quickly. You know, the doctor said if it was five years down the road, that would be much better, but for just a few months later. And man, that second time was just devastating and it was so much harder to kind of wrap my mind around it. And I mean, the, Satan just played in my mind. I just really struggled to look up at God and um, and so that was what I put a prayer request out to my friends and family and just said, pray for my mind. You know, I, I want to, you know, see God in this and I need your help to do it. Uh, there's a Bible verse, um, I think I wrote it down, Exodus 14, 14, and it says, you know, the Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be still. And oh my gosh, so I just took great comfort in that because there were definitely moments where I just, and I just couldn't even pray. And, um, and so that was about a year and a half ago. And so this past year and a half has really been difficult. Um, it seems like every PET scan I went to was bad news. You know, the, the tumor's growing, the, the chemo's not working. 
you know, we're gonna have to try to find something else. And um, probably the low point came this past April, you know, during COVID. <laughs> and um, I went to the PET scan that day and um, it said that the tumor had doubled in size just since January and that we'd have to find a different chemo to use. And um, oh, that was just really, just hard to, to kind of take that in. And, you know, I wanted the doctor to be straight with me, so I asked some pretty hard questions. And, you know, he just said pretty much that this chemo will hopefully prolong your life. You know, you might have a year, you might have more, you might have less. July, this past July, I had another PET scan and, you know, I always kind of dreaded, <laughs> dreaded going because it, it just had been bad news after bad news. And, um, but we, my husband and I drove to Rochester that day and I remember seeing this billboard, it said, um, got like something about cure, getting cured of cancer twice. I was like, oh, I'm like, I kind of like that. I'm like, maybe that's a sign. And so then I went and did the PET scan and I always ask them when I'm laying on the table that um, if they can play Christian worship music because that just really, it just comforts me in a way that nothing else can. And um, so one of the things that the songs that was played that day was God's Not Done With You. And I'm like, oh, that's right, you know, God's not done with me yet. And, and so we had to wait a few hours for the results. And um, so we went to, the, she called us back and I mean it's it's just amazing the doctor came in and she was practically dancing into the room even with her mask I could tell she was just like smiling so bright and she said it's shrinking the cancer is shrinking and I just couldn't believe it um, you know you pray and you hope I had always hoped and you know I knew God did miracles I just didn't know if if you know, I would get that miracle, you just didn't. And so to hear those words that it's shrinking, and this is my 11th chemo that I've been on, you know, it was not, they didn't give me any hope regarding that. And so I just told her, I said, that is all God. I go, people, so many people are praying for me, and, um, you know, that's God. You know, when I look back at this cancer journey especially, you know, I think of, um, you know, what if God would answer that first prayer for healing? And I just think, you know, no one wants cancer. I don't want to go back through it. You know, it's horrible to go through, but man, I would have missed out. You know, there's been so many blessings and um, I've just seen so much kindness from God in the past few years. and. I've had so many opportunities to talk about God, which I maybe never would have had before. Um, I used to have to go to Albert Lee um, like once a week or so for chemo. And so everyone's always asking you, how can I help you? And so I'm like, gosh, I need drivers. You know, my husband teaches and he can't bring me. And, and that has been the biggest blessing through this is one-on-one -on -one time with you know, it was friends, family, but it was also people I didn't really know that well. And I love one-on-one -on -one time. And so just the opportunity to share, you know, what was going on with me and to share God's words. And then, you know, they encouraged me too. And it just was like a win-win. And um, that's been amazing. And so, you know, when I look back at these three years, that's what I focus on is the blessings and God's kindness. You know, even when I was talking about all the chemo I did, I couldn't even remember. I'm like, well, how many months was that? And you know, you just, it's kind of like child labor. You forget the bad stuff when you have that baby. And that's kind of how this was. You know, I forget the bad things, but just remember all the good. So, I don't know, from the very beginning, I just felt called to, to share this. And, um, and even like the 428 prayer warriors, you know, I just pray for them that Gosh, they're praying for me every day at 428. I mean, wow, I hope that really encourages their prayer life and they can grow closer to God with that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is all God. These are not my words. And, and you know, if he can use any of this for good, I just, that's what, it, what it's about. And we're here to, to help each other and to share. Hello.
welcome. Well, we're here, our first in-person sisterhood since like what, last February. For those of you joining us online, we're so grateful to have you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Colby. I am the Director of Women's Ministry here at Zion. And on behalf of the entire sisterhood team and all of us at Zion, we are so glad you're joining us tonight. Influence, I like that word. Our theme for this year is influence. In September, we explored the story of Joseph and we talked about the influence we have in our family. In fact, I had a lady share with me that afterwards, her and her niece, whom she's very close with, read through the Joseph text together. You wanna to talk about influence? She is giving that child the gift of God's word on her heart. Are you kidding me? That is incredible. In November, we met Daniel and his boys in Babylon after they were exiled there. And we talked about the influence you have in your assignment, the, the place that God currently has you, like your workplace. I actually had one woman reach out and tell me that she's on assignment as grandma influencing her, her grandchildren. I love that. I didn't even say it in my talk. She just put two and two together. Yes, friend, as grandma, you are indeed on assignment for Lord Jesus Christ and a very important one at that. Ladies, you have influence, I'm telling you. I'm just gonna keep saying it over and over again until you believe me. I mean, of all the things that the enemy might want to lie to you about, going after your God-given influence will be at the top of his list. Lies like, you can't make a difference, that you're not worthy enough to impact anyone else, that nobody's really listening to you or watching your life anyway. You know, the reason why the enemy lies to you about your influence is because he knows the truth about it and it scares him. And so tonight we're gonna to talk about the influence through your, wait for it. I'm about to use that dreaded Christian T word, influence through your testimony. And we're gonna do it by meeting a nameless woman found in the book of John chapter four. If you have your Bibles or a Bible app, feel free to read along with me uh, or they're on the screen. John chapter four, starting in verse one. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. We're not gonna start off on a super high theological note here because actually, I don't really understand how the Pharisees' incorrect belief of who was baptizing more than who would cause our Lord to move. One scholar noted that Jesus didn't want people believing that his ministry was somehow competing with John's ministry, so he left. Maybe that's it, I don't know. Here's what I do know. When Jesus moves, it's best to let him. He has good reasons. The scriptures say he had to go through Samaria. That word had there means it is necessary. So it was necessary that he went through Samaria. We need to have a little geographical and contextual conversation before we understand why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The Samaritans were basically a hodgepodge of people from all over. What happened is that many years before this moment with Jesus, a nation called the Assyrians captured people from all over, including from Israel, exiled them, and then deported them. The people who became the Samaritans are the people who were left behind and did not get to go back to their native lands when everyone else was deported. These people then intermarried with, with one another and it created a mashup of religions. In fact, the Samaritans worshiped Yahweh, Yahweh being the Hebrew name for God in the Old Testament. The Samaritans worshiped Yahweh, but they only used some of the Old Testament books as their scriptures and they compromised their faith with pagan idol worship. The result was hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans over ethnic, religious, and even political views. Now for the geographical lesson, Judea, Galilee, Samaria. Samaria is right in between Judea and Galilee. Then you have the Jordan River that kind of goes around it like this. The Jews hated the Samaritans so much that when they were traveling between Judea and Galilee, instead of taking the direct route straight through Samaria, they would actually go around Samaria, crossing the Jordan River twice in order to do so. I am sorry, but that is a significant hatred. But enter Jesus. He had to go through Samaria. Oh, sis, I'm sure he did. Continuing on in verse five. So he came to a town in Samaria called Zychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
Can I just tell you, can I just stop and tell you that I am major Bible fangirling right now? We just got done studying Joseph in September and here we are discovering that Joseph and his father Jacob have a, have a personal connection to this particular piece of land. And now Jesus, being fully man, is tired and like what, the savior of the world just casually decides that this will be the perfect resting spot for him. Fangirl moment. This is just so cool to me. Okay, scriptures tell us it was about noon. And we read on in verse seven, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Before we even meet this woman or dive into her story, we already know a lot about her by the fact that she came to the well at noon. You see, the normal time to draw water was in the cooler hours of the day, either in the morning or the evening. Noon is the hottest part of the day. This woman went to get water, fully believing that no one else would be there when she got there. And she went alone. Why, did, why was she going to the well alone at the worst part of the day? Why doesn't she go in the morning when all the other women in town? I, I think you could guess why. She's an outcast. She isn't popular. She's not accepted. Her neighbors despise her. She's not a part of a friend group. She doesn't have support system. They view her differently than all the others. She's certainly not welcome to go with them. And maybe, quite possibly, she's even been asked to not go with them. They do not want her around. And regardless of the circumstances that led up to her walking to the well at noon by herself, here is what I believe about this woman. She's unwanted. At least she feels that way. She's hurting and she's lonely. And wouldn't you say that those just about describe all of us at some point in our lives, unwanted, hurting, and lonely. She has no idea that she's about to meet a man who will change her life, but not because he's a man, but because he is God. Verse seven, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. We already know that the Jews and the Samaritans did not like one another, but also men were not supposed to speak to women publicly unless they were related. The world does not approve of this woman. And yet the son of God asked her for a drink. Will you give me a drink? This is more than just Jesus being thirsty. This was an invitation for connection, for conversation, for relationship. It was an icebreaker question. I mean, it was a deep icebreaker question. It's like Jesus said, I know Jews don't talk with Samaritans, but you're all one in me. Will you give me a drink? I know I'm a man and you're a woman, but both are created in the image of God. Will you give me a drink? I know you're here at noon, I know why you're here at noon, but I remember your sins no more. Will you give me a drink? I know why you came alone, but I am with you to the end of the age. Will you give me a drink? I know what they say about you, but I care for you. Will you give me a drink? I wanna have a conversation with you. I wanna have community with you. What do you say? Will you give me a drink? And with that one question, Jesus speaks worth into her life. And the woman bites, she's curious, but she's also suspicious. Who does this man think he is? He doesn't understand every, she doesn't understand everything that's connected to his question. So she asked, how can you ask me for a drink? Another translation puts it this way. Why are you asking me for a drink? She goes straight for his motivations. And Jesus answered her in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This is a very significant statement and we need to break it down. The Greek word for gift here in this text is used 10 other times in the New Testament. All of them refer to the gift of God. These are the gifts of God that are referenced in other parts of scriptures. Forgiveness, grace, righteousness, and the Holy Spirit. It's like Jesus says, if you knew my gift of forgiveness, if you knew my gift of grace, if you knew my gift of righteousness, if you knew my gift of the Holy Spirit, 
you know, for us, I think it's important that we finish those sentences for our own lives. Like if you knew the gift, God's gift of forgiveness, would you be able to forgive yourself of that abortion? If you fully recognize the gift of God's grace, would you press forward in repentance after you just blew up at your husband yet again? If you understood God's gift of righteousness, would you see yourself as he does, pure and blameless, even after all those late night rendezvous? Oh, sis, if we, if we had any idea just how incredible the gift of the Holy Spirit is, God's Spirit himself dwelling in us, is there anything, anything at all, that you or I could not do or overcome? But we have to know. And then we have to walk forward in faith, believing that these gifts are true and real. Jesus went on to say, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him. This begs the question, who is God? Do you know him? Who is he to you? What is his character like? Let me tell you, let me tell you, sis, God is faithful, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is light, there is not an ounce of darkness in him, 1 John 1, 15. God is patient, 2 Peter 3, 9. His way is perfect and his word is flawless, Psalm 18, 30. He is a God of justice, Psalm 56. He is gracious and righteous and full of compassion, Psalm 116, 5. He is a God who saves, hallelujah, Psalm 68, 20. He delights to show mercy, Micah 7, 18. He, God is love, he is love, 1 John 4, 18. He is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory, Deuteronomy 24. These characteristics aren't even including the fact that he's all powerful, all knowing, and all together everywhere, all the time. He is God. And what I want, what I want so desperately is for you to know him. He is good, he is worth knowing, and he is worth following. Now finishing up in verse 10 now, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay, sis, if you've been a Christian or have been around a Christian for more than like two minutes, you've probably heard the phrase living water. We use it a lot. I want to read you the rest of the conversation between, between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and then we'll dig deeper into the meaning of living water. So verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will, be, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In the Old Testament, depictions of living or running water was often used to figuratively describe divine activity. So although it's metaphorical, there is something supernatural about living water. Okay, quick confession time. I thought uh, more, more like I was hoping that I would, I don't know, maybe never have to teach from the book of Revelation ever. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the book of Revelation is the very last book in the Bible and it contains visions and prophecies about the end of the world and about Jesus's return. There's just a, a lot of difficult stuff in it for me to understand, let alone teach it. Oh, but, oh, how silly for me to think that I could just bypass this important book of the Bible forever. But I am so excited to tell you that the book of Revelation did in fact live up to its name, giving me major revelation on the topic of living water. Okay, I want you to visualize this. I want you to put this in your mind. It will help you understand. We're going to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. My Bible headlines it as Eden Restored. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. So this river is flowing from both the throne and the Lamb, the Lamb being Jesus Christ. The river is flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb down, down the middle of this great street in the city. So we, so we have this street river thing. Streets are mechanisms for transportation. They connect point A to point B. There's a lot of movement and motion in them. Rivers are similar, but they primarily flow from point A to point B, carrying and depositing nutrients to the surrounding land as it flows. So you kind of have this, this river that can move wherever it wants. Does that make sense? And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, 
bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its, yielding its fruit every month. Okay, so the tree of life, that's tree singular, even though it's on both sides, some, is somehow on both sides of this river street thing. Now scripture doesn't say it, but I happen to know that at least here on earth, tree roots position themselves towards the nearest water source. So we have the throne and the lamb, we have the street river, we have the tree of life, and the tree of life is getting its water from the river of living water. The number 12 indicates, usually indicates uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, or it can mean the 12 disciples. But the point I really want you to understand is that the tree is always producing fruit because it's connected to that living water. There's a regular, continual harvest, and it goes on and on. We're still talking about the tree here. Scripture goes on to say, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. All right, let me recap the living water in Revelation real quick. It's pure and beautiful like crystal. It comes from both the throne, the throne of God signifying the power and authority of God, and from the Lamb who is Jesus Christ, whose life has been offered as a sacrifice for ours. It creates this river street thing that moves from the throne and the lamb to the tree of life, among other things. The tree uses the living water to produce fruit and heal the nations. And the people who partake in this living water have Jesus Christ's name on their forehead, which is just another way of saying that, that those who have access to this living water belong to Jesus. They are his people. And every time they look into that crystal clear living water and see their reflection, they'll be reminded whose they belong to. Okay, stay with me on this. I'm going back to the book of John, chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the spirit. I hope somebody has seen where this is going. The same living water found in the restored Garden of Eden when Christ returns and writes all wrongs flows from within us as believers right here, right now to the rest of the world. That means that through the Holy Spirit, we have all power and authority from God's throne. We have the redemption and forgiveness that comes from the blood of the lamb. We have the ability to produce a continual good fruit, which is the advancement of God's kingdom. And we can bring healing, including healing to the nations. The Holy Spirit in us is the only thing that will ever truly satisfy our souls and we are meant to pour it out. We are not meant to hold this living water in. We're meant to be a fountain of it, welling up to eternal life. It is meant to flow from us to the rest of the world. And this is the living water that Jesus is telling the Samaritan woman about. And this living water quenches a spiritual thirst, the deep desires, longings, and needs of our hearts. They can all be satisfied through Jesus. That emptiness in our lives that just nothing on this earth can fill gets filled in Jesus. And who wouldn't want that? And so, of course, verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The woman wants the living water that satisfies the soul. But know what she adds Note what she says as a reasoning so that I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. Let me say this. Following Jesus is hard, but also not following Jesus is hard. It's exhausting to keep coming to a well, whatever that well may be, food, drugs, alcohol, your workout routine, your career, sports, hobbies, our friendships, our children, these elaborate vacations, a bigger house, a nicer car, only to find out they don't truly satisfy and you're left with a thirst yet again. For some of us women, <laughs> our well, the thing we keep coming back to to satisfy our emptiness is a man, or maybe men, plural. And Jesus said to her in verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, you have had five husbands and the man you are now with is not your husband. 
What you have just said is quite true. One commentator put it this way. Her serial relationships with men, whatever their causes, are symptomatic of a heart thirst that well water cannot quench. But Jesus is not condemning her. He's not shaming her. But he does know her heart and he knows ours too. He knows that we want to feel loved and we want to actually be loved. For many of us, he knows how we've longed for a man or are still longing for a man. For still other of us, he knows how we've expected our imperfect man to be perfect, only to be so disappointed when he's not. And for some, he knows all about the number of men we've longed after, gone after, and had. These longings, all of them, are symptomatic of a heart thirst that well water cannot quench. Only living water can do that. Jesus is the only man who can satisfy your heart thirst. But that's not because he's a man. That's because he is God. The woman replies to him in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. And before I tell you the rest of his response in verse 21, I, I just have to share this with you. If someone come, calls me woman, it's an invitation for a fight. Like, take these earrings off and get ready to rumble. So I kind of laugh when I read about Jesus calling her woman. Like, oh, you brave, Jesus. But actually, the term here is one of endearment. And get this, the word also means wife. Now, Jesus wasn't actually married to her. We know that. But we do know that scriptures refer to Christ's church as his bride. And he's currently talking to a woman who has men problems. In essence, it's like he's saying to her, wife, believe me, I'll be your husband. I just love that. Isn't that so tender of our Lord? I'm going to read to you the rest of Jesus' response out of the message translation this time, starting in verse 21. Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We, wor we Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming. It has, in fact, come when what you are called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer, being itself, spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. Jesus tells this woman, of all people, how we must worship the Father. We must worship in spirit and in truth. Our worship must affirm the realities of truth, that Jesus is the truth, be doctrinally informed and be directed towards Jesus. In verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And actually what he says there is, I, the one speaking to you, I am. I am is a claim to deity. Jesus is claiming that he is God, that he is the Messiah. All right, let's finish this thing up. I'm skipping verse 27. Sometimes us disciples really have no idea what God is up to or why, which is exactly what happens in this verse. So skipping it ahead to verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and made their way toward him. In her excitement and haste, the Samaritan woman just leaves her water jar at the well. Like, ain't nobody got time for drinking well water when you found living water. I wonder if as she sat down her water jar, if she got a quick glance at her reflection in the water, if she saw Jesus' name written on her forehead, her whole identity has changed. Now remember, she's not the most liked person in town and she doesn't have the best reputation, yet it doesn't stop her from sharing 
with the rest of the town. Her invitation is simple. Come, see. And the result of that invitation is found in verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard it for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I told you that tonight's talk was about your influence to your testimony, but it's not really that complicated. It's not a 30 minute conversation. Listen, your testimony isn't about you. Your testimony is about Jesus. It's just the story of how you came to know him. This whole Bible passage isn't about the Samaritan woman at the well. It's about Jesus at the well. You have influence through the simple invitation of come see. It'll be because of God's own words and his good character and his living water that people will come to faith in him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you met the Samaritan woman at the well at noon. Nobody else cared about her, Lord, but you did, and you showed up. God, thank you that you meet me at my wells at an hour when I'm too ashamed to go any other time. God, it is my prayer that the women listening tonight, that they would spend some time seeking you and would discover what they're trying to fill their lives with, what that emptiness is trying to be filled with. And God, I pray that they would replace it with you with your living water, with your Holy Spirit, with your gifts of forgiveness and righteousness. God, thank you that our names are written. Thank you, God, that your name is written on our forehead, that we belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
as you finish what you start I will trust you in the process I believe you God oh, when I only see in part I will prophesy your promise I believe you God cause you finish what you start I will trust you in the process I believe you God and fear can go to hell and shame can go there too cause I know whose I am God I belong to you cause fear can go to hell and shame I know whose I am God I belong to you Yes fear can go to hell And shame can go there too Cause I know whose I am I belong to you And fear can go to hell Shame can go there too Cause I know whose I am Prophesy your promise. I believe you, God. Oh, cause you finish what you start. I will trust you in the process. I believe in you when I only see in part. I will prophesy your promise. What you start, I will trust you 